Namaste. In the last lecture, we looked at biodiversity, which is the variety of life in all its forms and at different levels of organization. Today, we begin a new module, which is conservation of biodiversity. In this module, we will have three lectures, threats to two species, in which we shall discuss the kinds of challenges that different biodiversity are facing on this planet. Now, a large fraction of these threats are because of the impacts of human beings, the anthropogenic influences. So, for instance, if we remove forests, if we uh, divert forests for say agriculture or for setting up of buildings or industries, then the habitats of the species are lost. That is a major threat. So, in this lecture, we should look at the different threats that are there to different species. In the second lecture, we shall have ex situ and in situ conservation. Ex situ refers to conservation that is off site. In situ refers to conservation that is on site. So you can perform conservation of species, conservation of biodiversity, either in the habitat where they are being found. For instance, if you uh, preserve or conserve a forest, where animals are found, if you convert that into say a national park or a wildlife sanctuary and manage it in such a manner that the species are protected and conserved, then we will call it an in situ conservation, conservation on the site where the species are found. On the other hand, if you take out certain species from their natural habitats, place them in zoos and conserve them, that is protect them and see to it that they are able to increase in their numbers through reproduction. In such cases, we will say that this is an ex situ conservation, conservation off site, not in the place where the animals are naturally found. So in this lecture, we shall look at ex situ and in situ conservation, the different forms of ex situ and in situ conservation. And why are we doing this conservation? Because it provides us with certain benefits. So in the third lecture, we shall look at benefits from conservation. So let us now begin with threats to species. What are the threats to species? Now threats to species are the opposite question to why things are found where they are found. That is when we talked about biodiversity and when we discussed that camels are only found in deserts because through the process of evolution, they have now developed those traits, those characteristics that make them best suited for a desert habitat. So they have a good amount of storage of food and water in their bodies. They have padded feet they, that permit them to walk on the deserts. They have long eyelashes that protect their eyes from the sand and so on. Now, when you have an animal that has these characteristics and if the deserts are lost, if there is no desert that remains, then where will this animal go? This animal cannot live in polar areas because it does not have the characteristics that would permit it to live in polar areas. In the case of polar areas, we require a complete different set of adaptations, something that is found in the polar bear. So you would require long fur. A camel does not have long fur. You would require ability to blend with the surroundings that is white in color, but a camel is yellow in color, yellowish brown. So the camel will be very easily spotted by the predators that are found there. It would require adaptations to gather food that grows in the polar areas. That is ability to feed on things like algae or lichens. Whereas the camel is adapted to feed on thorny bushes. Now it does not have uh, thorny bushes in uh, the polar areas. Whereas it does not have the adaptations to feed on those organisms that are found in the polar areas. So in that case, the ability of camel to survive would depend on the availability of the habitat to which it is adapted. So basically the camel lives in the desert areas because it has a pull factor from the desert because it has those adaptations that permit it to live without any major competition in the desert areas. If the camel moved to say uh, an evergreen forest or say a deciduous forest, 
then though it will be able to get its food but it will not be that efficient in getting that food it will not be that efficient in running away from the predators that are found in the forest and so in no time it will get hunted out so it does not live in the forest areas because it is getting pushed from the forest areas because there are certain species that are living in the forest areas that are either more competitive than camel so they are able to displace it out or that are predatory species that are going to hunt it out so it will not be found in the forest areas because it is getting pushed from there whereas it gets a pull factor from the deserts because in the desert it does not have any competition so the major threat that organisms face today is that they are having push factors everywhere and pull factors nowhere why because we are reducing we are removing those habitats where different organisms are found in the case of deserts we are doing a lot of mining in the deserts mining for sandstone mining for marble mining for sand mining for petroleum and a lot of other things in a large number of cases we are also converting deserts into farmlands by bringing in water from outside so we have developed an extensive canal system and once you have the canals you have a good availability of water and so now the habitat changes now you have lush green grasses there you have the agricultural crops and the camel is not able to compete in those situations it was very well able to compete in a desert but it is less able to compete in more equitable conditions then if you talk about the uh, the species that are living in the forest we are diverting forests like anything we are diverting them for agriculture industry for um, making habitations for mining purposes for setting up of roads so on if you talk about the coastal area there are a large number of species that live on the coast but then we are converting coasts into beaches we are setting up huge concrete sea walls now these sea walls are to protect the coastal areas the buildings that are be, uh, that have been built in the coastal areas but once you have a, a sea wall how will animals come to this area to say lay eggs in the case of river habitats we have already observed that in a large number of cases we are over exploiting the water resources we are pumping out water and taking it to other places so that now less and less amount of water is available for the animals that live there we are mining away the sand that is there on the beaches so in these situations how will animals such as ghadiyals or crocodiles or turtles lay their eggs we are doing an over exploitation of fishes by doing extensive fishing now if you take out all the fishes from the water what will the predatory animals that live in water feed on we are converting the rivers into ponds by making dams so we are converting a flowing system of water into a stagnant system of water and both are very different characteristics so the animals that live in the free flowing rivers now they have got nowhere else to go so essentially we are creating situations through large scale habitat modifications such that now there are a large number of species that are getting a push factor from everywhere and they do not have any place that attracts them that pulls them and if they are getting pushed from any from everywhere where will the animals go in such situations the only option is the extinction of the animals so this is the major threat that the animals are facing today push factors everywhere and pull factors nowhere now what are these push factors no suitable habitat that is the habitats that remain are either too hot or too cold or they do not have trees they do not have food there is no availability of nutrients they are completely burnt out in a large number of cases people deliberately set fire to forests and to grasslands so that once the cover is gone once the trees have been burnt 
the minerals that are present in their bodies they are now available in the form of ashes and this ash on the erstwhile forest floor will now support grasses and so in a large number of cases we find that people that rear cattle they set fire to the forest to convert it into grasslands so that their animals can feed there but in such a situation where will the animals that live in forests go you have completely removed their habitats or the habitats that remain are rich in noxious factors they are too polluted we have polluted our rivers our water bodies to such a large extent that in a large number of cases now they do not support the biodiversity that they were supporting before even in the case of air pollution when we talk about species such as lichens now lichens live in those areas that have unpolluted air you increase the level of of pollution and you will find an extermination of the lichens or habitats that are not suited behaviorally because there is habitat selection now habitat selection means that through behavior certain organisms prefer certain habitats so for instance there can be a species of bird that lives in say uh, mango trees now this bird can also make a nest in say a jamun tree but it will never make a nest in the jamun tree it just prefers to make a nest in the mango trees now if the mango trees are gone then there will be no place where this bird would feel comfortable and if the bird is not comfortable it will not make a nest it will not give rise to young ones and slowly the population will move towards decline or we can have situations where there is a lot of competition we have a large number of invasive species so we have looked at lantana camara a species that was brought to india for horticultural purposes but that has now spread to our forests now this is a species that makes toxins it stores toxins in its body and so a large number of animals are unable to feed on this species but at the same time it produces a very large number of seeds and the seeds are very hardy so the seeds are going to remain in the forest to give rise to more and more lantana plants and so this species is now replacing the indigenous flora of the forest so the indigenous vegetation is getting out competed the indigenous vegetation dies and the place is taken up by lantana camara now if you have such a situation then where would the native species go competition is also being observed in the case of animals so in the case of uh bharatpur uh, bird sanctuary we observed that there are species of catfish that were brought to this area to increase the uh, protein consumption of the locals so catfish is a very hardy species it can grow even in very polluted waters and it can feed on roughly anything so you can even feed it it waste and it will eat waste and it will uh, happily survive there but then the catfish was able to move out of the ponds because it can survive even out of water for a very long period of time and so in the rainy season it was able to move out and now it entered into the bharatpur bird sanctuary and now this is a major threat because it can live in very extreme conditions it can feed on roughly anything and so it is now feeding on birds and their young ones so you have a situation where there is a lar- large amount of competition especially because of invasive species that also pushes the native species out or the presence of too many predators or diseases in a large number of situations we have observed that people are now moving into the forest in a very large way and when people go into the forest they also take their dogs with them now if the dogs have rabies then rabies will also move into the forest ecosystem when people take their cattle into the forest areas then the diseases that are found in the cattle things like tuberculosis things like mastitis things like foot and mouth disease things like ringworm 
they also make an entry into the forest areas. So we are not just reducing the amount of space that is available for the wild animals. We are also making them more and more diseased by taking these pathogens into the forest areas. And if there are too many predators, too many diseases, too many invasive species, then that acts as a push factor because the indigenous native vegetation or the animals will be unable to thrive in such conditions. In certain cases, we are directly killing out the animals through poaching. Poaching for fur, poaching for ivory, poaching for skin, poaching for bones, poaching for gallbladder, poaching for meat. You name it and you have those poachings that are going on. That is another major threat to a large number of species, a big threat to our biodiversity. And then we also have certain small population dynamics. So if because of all of these factors, the population has reduced, then we will start to see Ellie effect is a condition in which once the population size has reduced, the efficiency goes down. So for instance, in the case of predators such as wolves or wild dogs that hunt in packs, these animals are able to run fast, but they are not able to run long. So when they are chasing a prey, so for instance, if you have a population of wild dogs that is chasing a sambar, then the wild dogs will run fast, but they will not be able to bring the sambar down. So what they do is that they set up a relay race. So as soon as the first dog is getting tired, another dog replaces it. Once this dog gets tired, a third dog replaces it and so on. So there will be a time at which the sambar will get tired and then the whole pack will be able to bring it down. Now, if the pack size is so less that they are unable to set up a relay race or if the pack size is so less that they cannot all attack the sambar to bring it down, then the whole pack will go hungry. Another example is that once you have population sizes that are very less, the animal density is so low that the animals are now unable to find their mates. They have to travel very long distances in search of mates and in a number of cases, they just do not find their mates. And so the efficiency of reproduction goes down. So these effects occur when you have smaller populations. Another small population dynamics is the stochastic deaths. That is random deaths. Now, if you have a population of 500 animals and if five animals die, nothing will go wrong because five animals is just 1% of the population. But if you have a population of say six animals and five of them die, then there is only a single lone survivor and the population will be completely extinct when this animal dies. So the stochastic effects also start to play a big role in the case of smaller populations. Now the factors or the push factors can be divided into those factors that push the population towards the smaller numbers through population dynamics. And these are called the declining population paradigm. So in the case of declining population paradigm, the population size is declining. It is reducing or factors that push a small population towards extinction called the small population paradigm. So once we talk about these factors, one, two, and three, then these are the declining population paradigm. They push a population towards the smaller numbers. And once you have a small population, then we have the small factor paradigm, which will push the small population towards extinction. So basically when we talk about extinction, there are two kinds of factors that are operating in any population. You have deterministic factors which act at large population sizes and stochastic factors which become more important when the population sizes are smaller. So what are these? Deterministic factors are things like birth rate, death rate and the population structure. So if in a population the birth rate is less and the death rate is more. So in this case, 
less number of animals are getting born in the population and more number of animals are dying out so slowly the population size will reduce so this is a deterministic factor it plays a role even in the case of large size populations things like population structure which means the proportion of animals that are in the reproductive age versus those animals that are very young or very old or the proportion of animals in the population that are females because the females will give rise to the next generation now if the population structure is disturbed and how can it be disturbed it can be disturbed even in the case of a large size population so for instance in the case of a large number of species such as crocodiles or turtles the sex of the young one is determined by the ambient temperature now because of global warming we can have a situation where all the young ones that are getting born they turn out to be males so in this population we will have an excess of males and a very less number of females when these females give rise to young ones again the young ones turn out to be males and so slowly and steadily the population will be composed of uh, all animals that are males and there will be no females left in the population in such a situation there will be no more mating and the population will become extinct so population structure is also something that uh, acts um, even in the case of large populations and this is a deterministic factor stochastic factors are chance factors they are important when the population sizes are smaller things like demographic stochasticity including occurrence of probabilistic events such as reproduction litter size sex determination and death so for instance if the litter size is less meaning that the next generation has lesser number of individuals it will not play a big role in the case of a large size population because just by chance it is possible that this year the litter sizes are less now they will be compensated by a larger litter size probably in the next generation so that is not a very big cause of concern but it becomes a big cause of concern in the case of smaller populations because in the case of of very small populations once you have a small litter size then the next generation has so few number of individuals that it is now being pushed towards extinction so these demographic stochasticity factors they occur even in the case of large size populations but they are not that important in large size populations because they get averaged out over several years then we have environmental variation and fluctuations so you can have things like an extreme flood or an extreme drought or you can have extremes of temperatures now they will play a role even in the case of large populations but for large populations so many individuals will survive these environmental fluctuations that the population will not be pushed towards extinction but in the case of a small population if you have a population of say only 10 individuals and of these 10 individuals seven individuals die in the case of a drought then the population has a very bleak future we have things like catastrophes such as forest fires and diseases genetic processes including loss of heterogeneity and inbreeding depression now if you have a small population then inbreeding depression becomes much more prominent because so few number of individuals remain in the population that the only option to breed is to breed amongst close relatives so you will have breeding between parents and children or grandparents and grandchildren or between uncles and nephews and so on now once you have meetings that are between very close relatives there is a very quick loss of heterogeneity in the population there will be inbreeding depression meaning that a large number of individuals will be born with many genetic disorders or with reduced efficiency or with things like a reduced sperm count or with large num number of abortions and so this will be pushing the the population towards extinction 
Then we have deterministic processes such as density dependent mortality on exceeding the carrying capacity of the habitat. Now in this case, if you, when the population sizes are very large, then there is a density dependent mortality because the density increases and once you have a high density, then diseases can spread very quickly among the population. Now in the case of a large sized habitat, once you have a large size population, then you will start to see the density dependent mortality. Now this is a mechanism that nature uses to control populations of different organisms. So once, you, once the population size is very large, then if a single animal becomes sick, then so many animals are getting in contact with this sick animal that they will also fall sick and ultimately the population, so many uh, individuals would die that the population size will be reduced. And that is fine in the case of large size habitats and large number of individuals. But now when the habitats are getting lost, so now you have a very small sized habitat that is left. And so even with a very small population, you have a high density of population. Now density dependent mortality will still play in the case of this small population and it will wipe out a large number of individuals that are there in this small population pushing it towards an, an even smaller population or pushing it towards complete extinction. So density dependent mortality occurs in the case of large populations and small populations whenever the densities increase but in the case of large size populations they are just a regulatory mechanism. In the case of small populations, they become an extinction mechanism. Then we have migration amongst populations. In the case of a large population, if a few animals migrate out, nothing big is going to happen. But in the case of a small population, if a few animals move out, then the population will may uh, become extinct. Especially when animals of a particular sex move out. If all the males move out or if all the females move out, then the remaining animals that are there in the population, they will be unable to breed and carry on the population forward. So these are the stochastic factors, which are very important when the population sizes are smaller. They even occur in the case of large populations, but for smaller populations, they are especially tragic. And the factors that drive species towards extinction can be remembered using the acronym HIPPO. H is habitat loss, I is invasive species, P is pollution, P is human overpopulation, and O is overharvesting. So human overpopulation is playing a big role in doing habitat loss, in doing pollution, in doing overharvesting, and in a large number of cases also in bringing invasive species to other areas. So of all the factors in HIPPO, the human overpopulation is the most important factor these days. Now the impact of humans is not the same on every species. It depends on a large number of factors. So sensitivity of the species to human impacts is dependent upon the adaptability and the resilience of the species. Is the species able to adapt to the changing situations? And if the population goes down, is it able to come back to the original state? A very good example in this case is the difference between tigers and leopards. Now, tigers are mostly found in those areas where the impact of humans is very less. They prefer living in the core areas of the jungles. They do not prefer human interactions. And so if humans degrade their habitat or destroy their habitat, the tigers will not have anywhere else to go. They are large sized animals and they find it very difficult to live in human dominated areas. Whereas in the case of a leopard, even if humans move into the forest, the leopard will be able to survive. Why? because it will start hunting on things like chicken, things like dogs, things like uh, goats or even smaller children. So this species, the leopard is able to adapt very well, even to human presence. It has a very resilient population. So even if humans kill a large number of leopards, the population will be able to come back. 
and it is also aided by the fact that the leopard is able to climb trees so there will be a leopard on a sitting on a tree and you will be unable to spot it and so it is difficult to exterminate this species but in the case of tigers because they cannot climb trees they will be found on the land and you can very easily wipe them out so the impact of humans will depend on the adaptability and resilience of the species it will depend on human attention charismatic species like tigers are more sensitive because humans have high demand for their skin for their bones for their other body parts so if you go to old palaces you can find that there will be a large number of bodies of tigers that have been shot and the bodies have been stuffed and they have been kept just as a display or you'll find the skins of tigers that have that are hanging on the walls or that are being used as the rugs now you will hardly find the body of say a nilgai or a sambar that has been stuffed and kept for display why because a tiger is a beautiful looking animal it is a charismatic animal it's a majestic animal and so humans have traditionally uh, paid a lot of attention to this species and because of that a large number of tigers were hunted and their body parts were used for display even today there is a high demand for the skins bones and other body parts of tigers especially in the case of traditional medicine and especially in the case of people who are super superstitious so you still have a large demand for tiger body parts because of which tigers are continually in at threat another factor is the ecological impact between humans and the species the greater the overlap the greater the impact so for instance the species that lived in the grasslands have been particularly hard hit because of the impacts of humans when the grasslands were converted into farmlands so there is a great amount of ecological overlap between human activity and the animal activity people used grasslands either to rear animals or later on to grow crops similarly the forests that are found in plain areas they were heavily cut down chopped for timber and converted into agricultural fields so the animals that were living in the forest and plain locations they were particularly hard hit much more than those animals that were say living in the peaks of different mountains because humans have hardly any use of the peaks they are difficult to go to so the amount of ecological overlap also plays a role in the amount of impacts that humans have and the home range requirements of species species that require larger home ranges are more sensitive to human impacts because when there is even a, a small amount of impact the home range reduces once the home range goes below a certain size then the animals are unable to survive there this is particularly important in the case of animals that are say mega herbivores animals like elephants now elephants require so much amount of food that they cannot be kept in a small area because if you keep them in a small patch of forest they will eat up everything and the whole forest will collapse so they typically require large size forest so that once they have eaten in one area they will move to another area then they will move to yet another area and by the time they come back to the first area this area has already regenerated it has been given sufficient time for the new plants to thrive but if you have a small sized forest these animals cannot live there or animals like tigers if you keep tigers in very small patches of forest they will eat up all the herbivores and very soon there will be no food left so tigers also require large areas now if humans reduce the areas then these species are particularly hit whereas those species that have very small home ranges species like rabbits or hares or say rats and mice they will not be that much harmed because even if there is a small patch of forest then there is plenty of space plenty of uh, resources for these animals to live so the impact also depends on the home range requirements of the species 
So how real is this threat? What is the rate at which we are losing the species? Is it just a, th a theoretical thing or are we actually looking at destruction of species? And how many species are we losing? Now, according to the island biogeography model, the species richness of an island is given by S is equal to C into A to the power Z, where S is the species richness, that is how many number of species are there in this area or the amount of biodiversity of the island. It is equal to C, which is a constant into A, which is the size of the island to the power of Z, which is where Z is another constant. So essentially what we are saying here is that if A increases, that is the size of the island is more, then the number of species will also be more, which is quite expected because a larger sized island will typically have more number of habitats, which will support more number of species. But if you increase the size of the island by say double, the species uh, richness will not double because it is related by a factor of Z and it is controlled by the factor C. Now, in the uh, when we use this model and in the case of forest, forest can also very easily fit into this model. Because if you consider a forest that is surrounded by human dominated la landscape, that is you have a small patch of forest where uh, and it is surrounded by say agricultural fields or by human habitations. So this forest is acting like an island. So we can very easily use the island biogeography model in the case of patches of forests. And for various patches, we have found that Z is between 0.15 and 0.35. So taking a value of Z is equal to something in between say 0.3. For an area A1, we will have S1 is equal to C into A1 to the power 0.3. And if you reduce the area by as much as 90%, so if you take A2 is equal to only 0 0.1 of A1, then we can write S2 is equal to C into A2 to the power of Z and A2 is 0.1 A1 into uh, to the power of 0.3. And in this case, if you take out the ratio, you will find that it is roughly 50%. So by reducing the area by as much as 90%, the species richness becomes halved, which is a good thing in some aspects, because even when a large amount of habitat is destroyed, you still have a sufficient amount of biodiversity that is left. The problem is that those species that require larger habitats, larger home range species, they are preferentially targeted. So they will be lost, but a large number of species will still remain. So that is a good thing. But then if we look at the rate at which we are losing the tropical forest, it is actually point, uh, it is actually 1.8% per year. And if we take the lowest value of Z, that is 0.15, it would mean an annual loss of 0.25%, a very, very small fraction. But then if we look at the estimated number of species, it is 10 million. Multiply 10 million with 0.27% and you get 27,000 species being lost every year. With the most conservative estimate because we are taking the smallest value of Z. And this is only in the case of the tropical forest. We have so many ecosystems that we are destroying. And so the number of species that we are losing every year is very high. Now in a large number of cases, we do not even know which are the species that are getting lost. Because even before we have had a chance to observe the species, document them, even name them, they have become extinct. So the island biogeography model gives us an estimate and in a very conservative estimate, we are losing tens of thousands of species every year with the current rate of destruction. So this is an important finding that the threat is actually very real. Now, all the species are not equally susceptible to extinction as we have seen that certain species will be lost preferentially. And the susceptibility also depends on the rarity of the species. The rarer the species, the more are its chances of getting extinct. And rarity is the function of ecology and evolutionary characteristics of the species. So why are certain species rare? 
so if a species is rare then there are less number of individuals the smaller factor dynamics are already playing a role so if there is a, a little amount of impact of humans these species will be very easily lost they will become extinct but then the next question is why are certain species rare certain species are rare because of their habitat selection and evolutionary characteristics such as restriction of, to an uncommon habitat example is species that are found in desert springs now because springs in the desert areas are by nature very less in numbers if we had too many springs then probably the area would not have been a desert so the springs in a desert are very less so the species that have made the the desert springs as their homes they will automatically be very rare because their habitats themselves are very rare in other cases there are species with limited geographical range those species that are found in a single lake now these species are unable to move to other areas and so they have a very limited geographical range if this lake is destroyed if this lake is over polluted if th this lake is drained out all the species that are found in this lake they will become extinct and certain species typically have low population densities and in a large number of cases the larger sized animals have low population densities because they require more space so for instance if we look at elephants they will give rise to only one calf in each gestation and these cows will be produced after this a span of several years now this is a natural mechanism to keep the population in check because if the population of elephants increased beyond a limit then they would uh, wreak havoc to the uh, to the habitat and the whole habitat will be lost so through evolution it has been selected that these animals will have very less number of offsprings similarly tigers in the case of tigers one litter will typically have two to three cubs and these cubs will remain with the mother for two to three years so that the tiger population does not increase so much that it becomes uh, beyond the carrying capacity of the habitat so this is another factor why certain species are rare because they have low population densities now the destruction of habitats of these species that are already rare will have a much greater impact so what are these impacts on the habitat we have habitat degradation habitat fragmentation habitat displacement and habitat loss so let us now look at all of these habitat degradation is defined as the process by which the habitat quality for a given species is diminished and this quality is diminished because of several reasons the quality may go down because of contamination so here we are talking about pollution we can have air pollution water pollution eutrophication in which case the fertilizers that are being used in our farmlands they make their ways into the water bodies through the rain and once they have reached the water bodies they increase the algae population and the water plants population to such a high level that there is no space left for other species and once these large algal blooms die then all of the oxygen in the lake is used up by the decomposition of their bodies the lake becomes anoxic and no longer able to support any plant life so this is habitat degradation contamination by air pollution water pollution eutrophication pesticides and accumulative toxins and all of these reduce the quality of the habitat in the case of bioaccumulation what happens is that if there is pesticides that are sprayed on say grasses or on say species of the poaceae family such as rice or wheat then the insects that were feeding on these grasses either they would die or certain insects would still remain alive but they will have certain amount of these pesticides in their bodies 
these pesticides become stored in their bodies they become accumulated in their bodies now if you look at the food chain if you have a frog and the frog is eating these insects so a frog will typically eat tens or hundreds or thousands of insects and the pesticides of in the bodies of all of these insects will get accumulated in the body of the frog moving up the food chain a snake will eat several frogs and the pesticides in the bodies of all of these frogs will become accumulated in the body of this snake later on once a hawk eats this snake then all of these toxins are moved into the body of the hawk and a hawk will typically eat several snakes and so the pesticides in the bodies of all of these organisms it is getting increased in concentration and it is getting deposited in the bodies of different organisms and so as you move up the food chain the concentration of pesticides increases and so does their negative impacts so the birds will face a very great amount of negative impact of these pesticides things like ddt now when ddt was spread it was found that the birds laid eggs with very weak shells because of the impact of this ddt and before the chicks could hack uh, could hatch the eggs broke down resulting in a very great amount of destruction of different birds there was a book published by the name of silent spring because it turned out that when ddt was spread into several habitats say for the control of mosquitoes so many birds died that in the spring season it became very difficult to hear the chirping of birds so that is a habitat degradation that occurs because of contamination so this is an example of biomagnification in the clear lake ecosystem so this is a lake and uh, the scientists were looking at the concentration of ddd and in the water it was 0.01 ppm parts per million in planktons it was 5 ppm in fishes it was 40 to 300 ppm and in fish eating birds or piscivorous birds it was 1600 to 2500 ppm the concentration increases as we move up the food chain and this impacts a large number of uh, species that are especially on the upper echelons of the food chains another habitat degradation is trash the waste that we throw ghost nets now ghost nets are those nets that have lived past their useful life and a large number of fishermen just throw them out in the water bodies now the thing with ghost nets is that they are very efficient mechanisms to trap animals so even though these uh, nets are say broken or they are torn out they will still be able to catch a large number of animals and they will drown these animals they will not permit these animals to move away and so they become very efficient mechanisms for habitat degradation things like plastics we use so much amount of plastics and a large portion of that, those plastics is just dumped into the environment so this is the impact of a ghost net the animals get entangled this turtle is entangled in this net and once it is entangled it cannot move to the surface to breathe it cannot dive down it cannot get its food and if it is not rescued the animal will slowly perish a crab that is there in a ghost net large number of corals now this is a ghost net that is there on top of this coral and these animals will now no longer be able to get their food penguins so in the case of penguin habitats this is from uh, table mountain national park and you will find that so much amount of plastic is strewn around that it is degrading the habitat in our country in mukurthi national park we saw this nilgiri tar and there are these plastics in its habitat again habitat degradation when we went to manas tiger reserve we saw rhinoceros dung and inside the dung we found plastics So plastics are now everywhere we went to mahabaleshwar and here you find these macaques that are trying to drink cola from this bottle again trash so these are habitat degradation mechanisms we have soil erosion 
if soil gets eroded again the habitat is degraded the quality is reduced not just the quality of the land but also the quality of water so the water will have so much amount of sediments that it will not be say suitable for drinking or for su suitable for swimming of different animals and so on then fire regimes when the forests get burnt this is again habitat degradation because the quality of the habitat has gone down over exploitation of water if water itself is not present in large quantities in a large number of cases what we have observed is that when waters in the rivers are over exploited then the depth of the river water reduces and once the depth reduces quite a large number of animals are unable to move from one place to another place because they require a certain depth of water to swim you reduce the the depth and these animals will slowly be pushed towards extinction deforestation so when the forests are cleared so earlier we had all of these forests so there was a large size habitat now this portion has been cleared so the habitat has reduced in its quality and we are finding deforestation in a large number of areas for n number of reasons this is an example from balaghat district in madhya pradesh this is the satellite imagery from 2006 this is the satellite imagery from 2018 the same area so essentially we used an algorithm to find out the areas where there is deforestation so these are the points that show where uh, deforestation was detected we looked back through satellite images and this is the difference this is a uh, habitat uh, the, uh, this is deforestation for mining this is in umaria district so here again you can keep a track of this road so this is a common point and if you look at all of these forests this is in 2002 this is 2018 the forests have been cut down and converted into agricultural fields this is from bhopal district so bhopal in 2003 bhopal in 2018 so all of these trees are now lost because this area was converted into a small dam so these are all different examples of habitat degradation another thing is desertification conversion of habitats into deserts primarily because of overgrazing or because of faulty cultivation practices overuse of water in the case of cultivation practices and overgrazing which reduces or completely removes the cover of vegetation from the soil and once the cover of vegetation is removed then the soil becomes drier and drier because it is now fully exposed soil and slowly it will convert into a desert so overgrazing if you look at this area you are witnessing the conversion of a habitat into a desert because so few plants remain but then there is a huge uh, goat and sheep population that is being reared here so they will eat up all of these plants and slowly and steadily you will have a situation where there is no more vegetation cover that is left in this area or draining dredging damming so when a lake is being drained when a water body is being dredged if there is a dam that is being created all of these degrade the habitat over exploitation of biota over fishing over harvesting once that happens less amount of food is available for the predators quality has gone down introduction of exotic species especially the invasive species so this is habitat degradation reduction of habitat quality now if the quality reduces to such an extent that no more animals are able to live then we will call it habitat loss so habitat loss occurs when the quality of the habitat is so low that the habitat is no longer usable by a given species so then we will say that the habitat has been lost another thing is habitat fragmentation fragmentation occurs when a natural landscape is broken up into small parcels of natural ecosystems isolated from one another in a matrix of lands dominated by human activities at in, in and it involves both loss and isolation of ecosystems so when there is habitat fragmentation the natural landscape is broken up into small parcels so what is happening is that earlier we have a large size forest 
and now we have divided this forest into say two or four parts once that happens it becomes a very tragic consequence for those animals that have large home ranges because say consider there is a forest that is supporting say 10 elephants now these 10 elephants because elephants live in a herd so essentially it is supporting one herd of elephants now this herd moves through different places in the forest in different times of the year to get their food and elephants being mega herbivores they require lots of food so they have they are moving in different areas of the forest they are eating up trees and they are also playing a big role for the ecosystem because they make food available for other animals as well but then if you convert this forest into two parcels so there is a road that has come up through the center of the forest and now you have two small portions and there is so much amount of traffic that now the elephants are unable to cross from one side to another side so in that case we still have say 99% of the forest that is remaining because only 1% of the area has been converted into a road but now because you have two smaller parcels you cannot support one herd in either the first parcel or either in the second parcel and so now the habitat has become fragmented and this herd will very soon be lost it will become extinct because it will overuse the parcel where it is existing it will overuse all the resources and then so less amount of food will remain that the fecundity will go down the herd will stop producing more elephants there will be density dependent mortality and very soon the animals will become extinct there will be a local extinction whereas on the second parcel there are no elephants to to take care of the ecosystem and slowly that ecosystem will also move towards degradation so that is habitat fragmentation conversion of natural landscape into smaller parcels now larger fragments support more species because of three reasons one they have more diverse environments more number of habitats so more number of species they have more uh, uh, they are more likely to have both common and uncommon species whereas smaller fragments are more likely to have only the common species now uncommon species are typically those that have the larger home ranges and also the smaller fragments have smaller populations and so the small fact uh, population dynamics also plays a big role so the chances of getting extinct are greater so typically larger size fragments are vastly more important vastly more useful for the survival of, of a species once we break them into smaller fragments they are of very little utility even though a large portion of the habitat remains so what causes habitat fragmentation we have things like roads railways dams and other structures so typically the linear infrastructures the infrastructures that are in the form of a straight line things like roads and railways so they very easily fragment the habitat into smaller parcels now they can result in mortality when animals get into accidents with fast moving vehicles the animals will die or there is a physical barrier so in a large number of cases what we observe is that if there is a road that is moving through the forest then to prevent the accidents the road department will set up fences on both the sides now once you have fences on both the sides the animals have no way to move from one parcel to another parcel because there is a physical barrier or in a large number of cases the traffic density is so high that so many vehicles are moving there is so much amount of sound that the animals find it difficult to move from one place to another place there is a physical as well as a psychological barrier plus it increases access to anthropogenic influences once you have a road then people can get into the forest and once people are getting into the forest you will find it very difficult to stop poaching and to stop illicit felling of trees in the case of forests that do not have roads people do not have access to the interior portions so even though you will find certain amount of poaching on the fringes the core is more or less uh, safe but with roads the even the core areas become accessible to humans 
and with them we also have access to invasives and exotics another agent is the diversion of land for agriculture so that also fragments the habitats so we have habitat fragmentations because of infrastructures and agriculture and they can be both linear infrastructures and things such as dams or other infrastructures so essentially habitat fragmentation is playing a very big role when we are doing development we are making infrastructures in the name of development so we find that we are putting species through a large amount of threat because of habitat degradation habitat loss habitat fragmentation and we also have habitat displacement that we will consider in the next lecture so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind